Gannon was fighting for his life, and those were defensive wounds. Next came a crushing blow to his head that was so strong, it fractured his skull like an eggshell. That wasn't enough for this defendant. He retrieved a 9mm handgun, fired it again and three times. Two bullets struck the pillow near him and were caught in the fibers of that pillow. That third bullet entered his jaw, traveled through his head, fracturing his uh, mandible, his vertebrae, hitting his spinal cord and lodged in the back of his head and was recovered as autopsy. Gannon's life drained from his body, drop by drop. The photo that's on the screen right now is a picture of his bedroom. The same corner where he was in that picture or where you'll see him in the picture in the bed. Each one of those markers signifies a small blood drop that splattered across his wall. And I know people will say, well, who gives a shit about what's fair for Miss Stalk? The court systems do. The law does. The Constitution. The Bill of Rights. The war fought over these things that we're dealing with today. Old school laws, the presumption of innocence, right to remain silent. Enough that comes all the way back from old Boston and Paul Revere riding through the streets on his horse going, the British are coming, the British are coming. Old stuff, and it matters. And once we decide something, in the media, before you have heard one shred of evidence, we judge this case before anything has taken place, then all of that is lost. And we are truly a country that is no longer ruled by law, but by the media. You know, that's, that's good stuff. Talked about a motive or lack of motive could be a sign that there is insanity or not insanity. And it's in the jury instruction there. So it does matter. It's not required, but it matters. And it matters because it's evidence. If you don't have a motive, that goes to show a lack of evidence. That's what you're looking for, right? That's, that's the photo. That's what you're looking for, right? That's, that's the photo. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will turn your attention to the two boards, screens, this fancy pointer that you are alluding to, Judge. <laughs> it's pretty old. Um, all right, we've got a photo here. We've got some familiar looking faces. Gannon, Letitia Stouch. Stepmom, stepson, and his little sister in the back. Look at that. Looks like everybody's doing pretty good. Happy, sunny day. Maybe Miss Stout is doing a selfie holding the camera out. Whatever. When, when, a when, a when would have this photo been taken? The day before Gannon died, the day before he was killed. I 
It wasn't a photo of evil, anger, a photo of someone by all accounts who was a loving stepmother, care of Gannon. Gannon's father was on a deployment. Douch worked as a teacher herself in the Whitefield School District, an elementary school teacher. That's where the fragmentation personality comes in. What do you do? Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Does a kid handle that? Well, a lot of people that have had bad childhoods go on and they're fine. There's some that don't. Um, is a survival mechanism when these children's personalities fragment. Because in the case of the stout, her abuser was also the person that provided her means for survival. A four, five, six year old kid does not go out and get a job at work and acquire their own food, pay the electric bill, pay the rent. So while they're being abused, they also, as a matter of survival, have to both hate and love, to fear and placate their abuser, flash caretaker. And how does a person do that? Well, I think in a lot of situations, no one person can do that. That's where the fragmentation personality comes in. All the good and all the bad, all the evil and the hate reside in one place. And I know some of you based on your jury questionnaires, I think I'm telling some fanciful tale about this. I get it. I read the questionnaires. But as such, you have sworn an oath multiple times to follow the law and the evidence. You don't like vanity or dissociative identity disorder. That's okay. No or excuse or not valid. That's okay. Okay, if you think that outside, those doors. And here, you got to believe it's a legitimate mental health defense that, in fact, it exists and that it is scientifically backed. You're going to hear doctors, sworn experts on both sides. But yeah, it's in the DSM 4 or 5, which is a book of psychological ailments and issues. Psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose things. It's a listed. <laughs> the scientific community issue, a real issue, dissociative identity. Charge three bullets, a nine millimeter handgun at the boy, hitting him once, killing him once. I'll beat him, burn him, and do all these other things. You're Wrong, it's horrible. She, not saying. And she will be held accountable, not guilty by reason and insanity. We'll get a jury instruction that's about a paragraph long. In the case, in that case, and I think Judge Warner alluded to it, to one of the panel of potential jurists in the last couple of weeks, um, she's found guilty by, found guilty, then it's guilty. She's subject to regular sentencing by the court. But if I'm well, not guilty by reason of insanity, she walks out of here. She's committed to the state hospital, Colorado Department of Human Services, and they take over from there, state mental hospital. Over a movie where one lawyer asks a question and the other one stands up and objects. On TV, the lawyers start to argue with each other, and then sometimes they go up to the bench and they argue with the judge. I know you're going to be surprised, but that doesn't happen in real life. The lawyers in this room have years of experience. They know that the procedure in this case is governed by a written set of rules that apply to all criminal cases called criminal, uh, the Colorado Rules of Criminal Procedure. They also know that the evidentiary matters are governed by a written set of rules called the Colorado Rules of Evidence, which apply to all case proceedings. Uh, 
to all cases preceding the trial. Watch the lawyers, and you will observe that what really happens is that an objection will made is made. I will ask for an explanation, something like grounds, uh, for the objection, and the response from the attorney will be something like hearsay or foundation or relevance or 404. And most of the time, watch the attorneys closely. Most of the time, the attorneys will state an objection in five words or less. There's not a whole lot of arguing that's going on during that uh, time period. And regardless, the argument is never directed to opposing counsel because I'm the one making the ruling and not opposing counsel. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to evidence which they believe may not be properly offered. Do not draw any conclusions from the objections or from my rulings on the objections. If I sustain an objection to a question, the witness may not answer it. Uh, okay, all right, we got it. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that the count that you are dismissing is count three, child abuse resulting in death. In death. Right, so count one is murder for three. Who is uh, under 12? He is the child abuse resulting. Okay. Uh, that's the one that requires an accumulation of injuries, all that kind of thing. That was charged before Gannon's body was ever recovered. Uh, when Gannon's body was recovered, we added on, which is now murder for three. Okay, so this would have been. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is count three of the amended information. Okay, and that's what I wanted to check on because, um, and, uh, Rachel, I want to talk to you when we're done. Um, is there anything else that we need to address from the prosecution? Sure. Defense? Sure. Okay. Rachel, can you come back in the back hallway for a minute, please? All right, we're going to recess. Thank you.